Okay. So what I am going to do today is, is I think I want to start out with a bit of review um, and say like what is a model category and why are we doing all this stuff um, and uh, and then I kind of want to go through um, the the definition of the uh, of the level wise model category structure on Spectra which um, which Sam sort of got to at the end of his of his talk but I think it's important to see this kind of like basic model structure in detail before we, we get to the more complicated um, stable model structure. Um, okay, so, oh, I know what the issue is. Okay. <laughs> um, so that, that should get rid of the echo. All right, so, uh, so to start out with, uh, what is a model category? Um, So uh, Evo told us the full definition a couple weeks ago, um, but the basic idea is that it's a it's a category M uh, equipped with some special classes of maps, uh, cofibrations, vibrations, and weak equivalences that we often denote by these by these um, special symbols. Uh, and the weak equivalences allow the definition of a um, of a homotopy category. So there's this category ho m, which is what you get from m if you formally invert all the weak equivalences. Uh, but also the cofibrations and fibrations allow the construction of um, of models for uh, representing certain objects or diagrams in the homotopy category. So the idea is that an object in the homotopy category is sort of an equivalence class of objects, but there are certain nice representatives of it that might be nice from the point of view of um, doing some construction or something. Uh, and then there, there's this set of axioms, which, which Evo told us all about. Um, and Sam sort of talked about how to, uh, how to show that these axioms are true in certain cases. Um, but I think that the way to think about them is that there are, they're analogs of the homotopy extension and lifting properties. Um, which we talked about in the category of spaces already. Um, and there are these factorization axioms, which are analogs of the construction of mapping cylinders um, and uh, mapping path spaces. Okay. Um, so there's this there's this one type of model category which um, or, the, or this one this one idea which we often use to construct model categories um, which which Sam talked about and this is this idea of cofibrin generation so uh, so cofibrin generation means um, that there are so M is cofibrinly generated if there are two sets. Uh, I of generating cofibrations and J of generating acyclic cofibrations. Such that So such that these two sets um, define all the rest of the structure of the model category. So what that means, and I'm going to use uh, Evo symbols for um, the, the right and left lifting properties. Um, 
So for example, if we want to talk about the acyclic vibrations, so this is weak equivalences intersect vibrations, um, these should be exactly the maps that have the right lifting property with respect to I. Um, if we want to talk about the vibrations, those should be the maps that have the right lifting property with respect to J. The acyclic co-vibrations are the maps that have the right, the left lifting property with respect to the right, the maps that have the right lifting property with respect to J. Um, and it turns out that by, by some sort of formal arguments, um, you can also express this formula as the closure of J under a set of operations. So the maps that have the left lifting property with respect to the maps that have the right lifting property with respect to J are the same as the, um, the closure of J under um, under coproducts uh, pushouts along arbitrary morphisms Transfinite composition and retracts. Okay. Um, and typically, the language that's used here, if we isolate just these, uh, if we isolate just these three things, then the closure of J under under these three things is 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 usually called um, the class of uh, of relative J cell complexes. Um, and so you say, okay, an arbitrary acyclic co-fibration is a retract of a relative J cell complex. And likewise, um, the co-fibrations should be given by this formula, which is the, the class of uh, retracts of relative I cell complexes. Um, finally, uh, the, the weak equivalences, uh, every weak equivalence is a composition of a acyclic fibration following an acyclic cofibration. So if you know what the acyclic fibrations and the acyclic cofibrations are, then you know what all the weak equivalences are. Okay, so this is the idea of cofibrin generation and the, um, uh, and the point is that the entire structure of the model category is somehow given by these two, by these two sets of morphisms. So, um, so Sam talked about uh, how you, if you have classes like this, how do you show that the axioms of a model category hold? Um, and the main idea is this thing called this called the small object argument. Um, so, uh, yeah, and I think he explained that pretty well. So I so I don't I don't really need to go over that again. Um, uh, but but the point is that is the thing that that can be. Um, the, the main thing that you have to check in order to apply the small object argument is that the, the domains of the maps in I and J are small with respect to, um, with respect to the I cell and J cell complexes. Uh, so even if that argument goes through, um, specifying I and J doesn't necessarily give you a model structure. And the problem is that the, everything that I've written down here is a bit overspecified. So for example, we've said that the fibrations are supposed to be things that have the right lifting property with respect to J. Um, and we figured out what the weak equivalences are, but it's not automatically clear that the weak equivalences as defined this way, if you intersect them with the fibrations, you get, you get this, you get the set of things that have the right lifting pr property with respect to I. Um, so there, there are a few things that have to be checked uh, given some sets of maps I and J. Um, to say that they define a cofibrally generated model structure, um, and so that's uh, so so this is this is written down in this um, this recognition theorem. So this is, uh, and I'm not going to prove this. Um, I think Evo talked about this too. Uh, but the main thing that I want to do today is use this theorem to construct some some model categories. Okay. So the recognition theorem says, um, let M be a bicomplete category. Uh, 
Um, and let's fix some, some sets of maps, i and j in M. And let's also fix the maps that we want to be our weak equivalences. Uh, so under the following conditions, we get a cofirmently generated model structure. So first, the weak equivalences are closed under uh, composition. They satisfy the two out of three property and contain all identities. Um, second, the domains of I are small, are, are I small, so small with respect to the relative I cell complexes, um, and likewise for J. Um, and so this means that you can apply the small object argument to construct factorizations. And then to check that all the structure matches up, there are a few other things that you need to know. So the J cell complexes, I'll just write J cell for that, are um, their weak equivalences and their, uh, their co-vibrations. So they, they have this lifting property. Um, the things that have the right lifting property with respect to I are weak equivalences and also have the right lifting property with respect to J. And either uh, this is true. or this is true. Um, and I think in all the examples that I, that I will look at today, um, we'll end up checking this and this. So in other words, the two sets of maps, things that have the right lifting property with respect to I and W intersect things that have the right lifting property with respect to J are equal to each other. Okay, so the conclusion of the theorem is that under these conditions, um, then M is a cofibrantly generated model category um, with generating cofibrations cofibrations I generating acyclic cofibrations J. And weak equivalences W. Okay, so this is the this is the recognition theorem for for cofibrantly generated model categories. Uh, so, any questions so far? Is there something keeping that from being like trivially satisfied? Like if W, I, and J are empty or something? Um, so you always have some trivial model structures. Uh, and I think the ways that you can do it, you can pick everything to be a weak equivalence. And then this forces like only identities to be, or only isomorphisms to be cofibrations and fibrations. You can pick everything to be a cofibration. Um, you can do you can do stuff like that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, so there are, but those are not the cases that were that were usually. But I've only ever heard this talked about when these would mean what we want them to mean. I was just wondering. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, in some cases like that, it might be easier to just check. Like, if you know what all your classes of maps are supposed to be, then then you can just check the lifting properties directly. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, so I want to do an example. I want to actually apply this theorem to construct a, a model category. Um, and I'm going to do the example of topological spaces. Uh, and by topological spaces, I th think I mean compactly generated weak Hausdorff spaces. Um, so, so in this, uh, in this category, we're going to define W to be the weak homotopy equivalences uh, 
um, I to be the set of inclusions of a boundary sphere into a disk and J to be the inclusions like this. Okay, so specifically what I mean here is, um, is the things that look like this. All right, so that's the inclusion of D1 into D2. So, um, so first of all, W satisfies the required axioms. Um, it satisfies two out of three. Uh, because it's exactly the maps that become isomorphisms under the functor pi star. Okay, isomorphisms in any category always satisfy two out of three, so the same is true of W. Um, and the other properties are, are easy to check. Uh, for the smallness statements, so the, the first thing that we should realize is that a, um, a relative I cell complex is exactly a cell complex. So um, in other words, it's a composition of maps of the following form. So maps which are which are pushouts of a of a diagram that looks like this. Okay, so the pushout here is like X with a with an N cell attached to it. Um, in particular, uh, any relative CW complex is a relative I cell complex. The main difference between this definition of cell complex and, uh, and um, the definition of CW complex is that in a CW complex, you have to attach the cells in the order of dimension. And here you're allowed to attach the cells in whatever order you want. Um, but, it's, but it's really the same basic idea. Okay. So in particular, um, these are all uh, these maps are closed inclusions. And it's possible to show um, using using compactness of the of the spheres and the disks uh, um, that SN minus one and DN minus one are small with respect to them. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, this means that if if I have some relative, uh, okay, Jeff says I'm confused about definitions. A relative CW complex starts with some space A, not necessarily CW, and adjoins cells. I feel like what you're describing are absolute I cell complexes. Yes, I'm sorry, you're right. So, so, um, so I mean to be talking about uh, about relative cell complexes here. So you can start with an arbitrary space X and attach attach some cells to it. Um, and this gives you a this gives you a relative I cell complex. Um, but the smallness condition that we need to check is is we need to show that a that the spheres and disks are small with respect to uh, with respect to absolute cell complexes. Um, is that right? No, I'm sorry. No, with respect to relative cell complexes. Uh, so, if I have a if I have a a a, uh, a sequential co-limit of, of maps, each of which is a is a relative cell complex, and I have a a sphere mapping into the co-limit, then it factors through some finite stage of the co-limit. Um, yeah. So in any case, that's um, that's that's true because because the sphere is compact, uh, so it has to um, these these relative cell complexes are covered by the original thing and the cells, and the the sphere has to factor through the attachment of finitely many cells. 
Okay, so this is a consequence of, of compactness. Um, okay, so, uh, so the next things that we have to check are these conditions about the lifting properties. So let's start with this. Any relative J cell complex is both a weak equivalence and a, uh, a retract of a relative I cell complex. Okay, so we want to show that the J cell complexes are contained in W intersect this. Okay, so first of all, um, a J cell complex, uh, any relative J cell complex is a weak homotopy equivalence. Um, this is because the maps in J are all weak homotopy equivalences. And the property of being a weak homotopy equivalence is preserved under um, taking coproducts, pushouts, and transfinite composition. Okay, so that shows that the J cell complexes are contained in W. Um, and to show that they're, they're contained in here, uh, it suffices to see that the maps in J can be built as relative I cell complexes. So if I want to include a, um, a disk into a sphere, I can do it as follows. Um, so I can start, here's dn minus one. It has a boundary, which is, which is sn, uh, which is sn minus one, which is sn minus two even. Um, so using a map in I, we can attach a, a cell to this. Um, and so now we have an, an N minus one sphere and using another map in I, we can attach an N cell to this. Um, so so this is, this is an attachment of an N cell. Okay, so each map in J is, a, is given by attaching two cells using maps in I. Um, and so that means that that every map in J is a relative I cell complex, and that means that every relative J cell complex is also a relative I cell complex. All right. Um, okay, so the next condition is uh, that things that have the right lifting property with respect to I are equal to things that are both weak equivalences and have the right lifting property with respect to J. So first of all, um, since, uh, since maps in J are I cell complexes, um, let's see, a map F has the right lifting property with respect to I. Uh, if and only if it has the, the right lifting property with respect to all I cell complexes. Um, and since J, J consists of I cell complexes, this implies that, that F has the right lifting property with respect to J. Um, so finally, uh, let's, let's suppose that, um, I guess this isn't, this isn't quite final. Um, so suppose that, that we have some map F from X to Y. which has the right lifting property with respect to I. So, um, and we wanna show that this map is a weak equivalence. So first of all, um, having this right lifting property means that we can always construct lifts and diagrams in this form. Okay, so the, um, in particular, if we have a class in pi n minus one of X that becomes contractible in Y, um, then it also becomes contractible in X, okay? This a factorization through the disk is a null homotopy of that class in Y, um, and a lift of it is a null homotopy in X, 
So what this shows is that um, pi n minus one of x injects into pi n minus one of y for every n. Um, it's a little bit more complicated to show surge activity. Uh, here's one way to do it. Um, first of all, the inclusion from the point into an n minus one sphere is in I cell, it's a, it's a relative I cell complex. Um, and so that also means that, that the map from X to Y has the, has the right lifting property with respect to this map. Okay, so that so this shows that um, there's a a surjection from pi n minus one x to pi n minus one y. All right, so there so therefore um, f is a f is in w, so this is contained in w intersect this. Uh, conversely. Suppose that F is a weak equivalence that has the right lifting property with respect to J. Um, and let's remember that things that have the right lifting property with respect to J are serif vibrations. So this is a this is a serif vibration that's also a weak equivalence. Um, and what we want to do is we want to show that there's a lift in a diagram like this. Okay, so if we call this map C, um, then first of all, uh, C becomes contractible in pi n minus one y uh, because it factors through the disk. So because F is a weak homotopy equivalence, C must be homotopic to zero in pi n minus one x. Um, so therefore, we can extend the diagram like this. Now the problem is that this map from the disk into X may not be a map, it may not be a lift of the map from the disk into Y. Um, so we actually get two maps from the disk into Y. Let's call this one alpha and this one beta. Um, and, uh, and there are two cases. Um, so in case one, alpha is not homotopic to beta in Y. Um, but we at least get a map So we have these, these two maps from the disk into Y, and they agree on the, on the boundary sphere. So this is a map from Sn to Y, and uh, this lifts to a class in pi on X because, because F is a weak homotopy equivalence. Um, so, so what we can do is we can, uh, we, we, can, we can take this lift and we can replace um, the map from Dn to X with the lift of the other hemisphere of the sphere. Um, so uh, we can use this, this class. To uh, replace the, the original map Dn to X with one um, that becomes homotopic to alpha. Okay, so in other words, we can assume that we're in the second case, which is that alpha is homotopic to, to beta in Y. Okay, again, referring back to this diagram. So, so now um, we have uh, the, a factorization of SN minus one to X through this disk. And um, we get two maps from the disk into Y and we're assuming that they are homotopic. 
Okay, so in that case, um, so let's let this map be the, the one that we've, we've already constructed. I guess I'll call it beta tilde because it's a lift of beta. Um, and there's a map from the n plus one disk in, into y, which is exactly the homotopy between alpha between alpha and beta. So um, in this uh, on this this hemisphere of the boundary of the disk, it's uh, it's the map beta, and on the other one, it's the map alpha. Okay. And now x has the the Sorry, this map has the right looking property with respect to J. So there exists a lift in this diagram. Um, and again, the other end of this lift is, is a lift of the map alpha, which is what we wanted. Okay, so this um, so this lift is this is a homotopy from beta tilde to a lift of alpha. Okay, so, uh, so what this shows is that um, if F is a weak equivalence and has the right lifting property with respect to J, it has the right lifting property with respect to I, and that concludes the proof. All right, so all this amounts to a proof of, um, there is, a cofibrantly generated model structure on top where the weak equivalences are the weak homotopy equivalences. And these two classes of maps, I and J, generate the cofibrations and acyclic cofibrations. Um, All right. Um, there are a few a few other arguments that we can make that are similar to this. Uh, one is we've done this on unpointed spaces, um, but it's it's not that difficult to extend it to pointed spaces. So uh, by essentially the same arguments, um, you can extend this to pointed spaces uh, where the generating cofibrations and acyclic cofibrations are exactly. Um, sorry, I think the symbol we use for this is a plus. So they're exactly what you get by adjoining a disjoint base point to, to all of these maps that we've already considered. Um, another thing like this, uh, which I'm leaving as, as an exercise if you want to really think about model categories for a while, is um, do the same thing for simplicial sets where uh, the weak equivalences are the set of maps um, such that the geometric realization of F is a is a weak equivalence in top. Um, the generating cofibrations are inclusions of the boundary of a simplex into the simplex. And the generating uh, fibrations Sorry, the generating acyclic cofibrations are the inclusions of um, of a horn into a simplex. And what I mean by horn is um, this is uh, the boundary of delta n minus a an n minus one simplex uh, minus a minus a non-degenerate and minus one simplex. Okay, so proving this is, is pretty similar to, to constructing the model structure on, on topological spaces. Okay, uh, maybe I'll, I should pause for a second here. Are there, are there any questions about any of this? All right, so, um, so let's move on to spectra now. Uh, so the model structure on spectra was mentioned at the at the end of Sam's talk, and and again I want to actually um, 
show you how it's it's constructed. Um, so the key tool uh, that we use to construct it is is this set of adjunctions between um, spectra and pointed spaces. So we have um, we have adjunctions where the left adjoint is called FD. This goes from pointed spaces to spectra. Um, and the way that this is defined is that if I have a space uh, A, then FD of A is the spectrum that uh, looks like this. So it has all points, except uh, it starts at A in the, D, in the D slot, and then from then on, it's suspensions of A. Um, so these are these are shifts of the suspension spectrum, and if if uh, d is zero, then it is is literally the suspension spectrum. And by evaluated d, uh, I just mean send a spectrum to its d space. So in this case, there's a cofibrantly generated model structure on spectra. Uh, where the weak equivalences are the uh, level-wise weak equivalences. So they're the set of maps of spectra x to y such that um, for each, uh, let me keep calling it d, for each d, um, xd is weakly equivalent to yd in pointed spaces. Uh, the generating cofibrations are what you get if you apply FD to the generating cofibrations in pointed spaces. And likewise with the generating acyclic cofibrations. Um, so, uh, before I prove this, let me make a few observations about, about the, um, the model category that this constructs. So, first of all, if you have any model category, the first question you should ask is what homotopy, what homotopy theory is this trying to present? What's the, what's the homotopy category of this model category? Um, so, uh, so in this case, If we take spectra and we invert the, uh, if we take the homotopy category of, uh, of spectra with the level-wise model structure, um, so a homotopy type in this is just a a bunch of spaces, um, a bunch of homotopy types of of spaces uh, equipped with some maps between their suspensions. Uh, so I guess I had something in my notes that I, I was going to say this is this uh, a homotopy type here is a, a choice of countably infinitely many homotopy types of spaces, but that's not really right either, um, because because you still have the data of some maps between them, uh, but it's still um, but uh, but it's still not not the right um, homotopy category. So this is not uh, the stable homotopy category. Um, so maybe a better way of saying this is that the homotopy type of an object here knows about the homotopy types of, of each of the spaces appearing in the spectrum, which is, which is more data than you actually want. Um, so, so in some sense, we want to be able to specify a, a spectrum starting at some point and not have to worry about the finite amount of data that comes before that point. Okay, so that's observation one. Um, observation two is that uh, we can say pretty explicitly what the what the vibrations are here. So if we have a map from X to Y 
which is in, which has the right lifting property with respect to J. So it's a vibration in this model structure. Um, so what that means is that we can find lifts and diagrams that look like this. Uh, Okay, but FD is a left adjoint. And so you can, you can transform this diagram using the adjunction to a diagram that looks like this. So this is equivalent to saying that for every D there's a lift like this. So in other words, um, uh, X to Y is a level wise serif vibration. Um, likewise, the acyclic vibrations in this category are exactly level-wise acyclic serif vibrations. Um, finally, uh, what does it what does it mean to build, say, a relative I cell complex here? Um, if you attach a cell to a spectrum X using a map in I, um, this means attach an N cell to the D space in X for some, for some N and D. Uh, it's suspension, which is an N plus one cell to X D plus one and so, and so on. Um, so in particular, uh, you're attaching some cells to all the spaces in X. So any, um, any relative I cell complex is exactly um, is any any relative I cell complex is a level wise uh, relative cell complex. Uh, and in particular, if we think about Adams's notion of CW spectrum, um, a CW inclusion of CW spectra is a uh, is an example of a relative I cell complex. Um, and a, yeah, um, this, is not, this is not an if and only if, so um, we're, we're attaching cells to the, to the levels of X in a specific way. Every time you attach a cell, you have to attach its suspension to the, to the future objects in X. Um, so this is just an inclusion. Okay, um, so let's let's prove the model structure. Uh, so um, the first thing that we have to check are these properties of the class of weak equivalences, namely that it satisfies two out of three and so on. And I think these are pretty clear. Um, a weak equivalence here is just a level-wise weak equivalence, and we've already checked all this stuff for for weak equivalences in in top. Um, the next thing is smallness. So, uh, so what we need to check is that um, if we have, uh, so given a sequential co-limit diagram, of maps in I cell. So let's call this X alpha. Um, we want to show that maps from one of these objects, which is a domain of a map in I into the co-limit is the same as uh, uh, sorry, is the same as the co-limit of the maps. Um, uh, 
the co-limit of the maps into the individual stages. Okay. Um, in both cases, we there's an adjunction that we can use. So this is the same as maps from a sphere. So maps now in top star from a sphere with a disjoint base point into um, the dth space of the co-limit. Um, and actually, if you think about the way that we can compute co-limits, so, so co-limits in spectra are computed level-wise. So this is the same as uh, maps from this into uh, the co-limit of the dth space of x alpha. Um, on the other hand, this is the same as uh, the co-limit of maps from Sn minus 1 into the d space of x alpha. And now the smallness statement follows because um, Sn minus 1 is small in top. So it, it commutes with such co-limits um, along, along relative cell complexes in top. And this um, and uh, any I cell complex in spectra is a level-wise I cell complex in top. OK, so, uh, so that, that, that proves this smallness statement. And likewise, you can do this with the disks instead of the spheres and show that those are also small. All right, um, what's next? Uh, the, the, J, the relative J cell complexes are contained in the weak equivalences. Um, and in the things that have the left lifting property with respect to the things that have the right lifting property with respect to I. Uh, so uh, again, this, this follows from stuff that we've, already, that we've already checked in the category of topological spaces. Um, so if we, if we build a relative J cell complex, uh, we, um, we do this by attaching cells to each level um, in such a way that's a level-wise weak equivalence. So that shows you that J cell is contained in W. Um, and, uh, and each of the maps in, in J can be built as an I cell complex. Um, and so by the same sort of formal arguments that, it, that implies the other inclusion here. Um, so I'm just gonna write same arguments as before. And finally, Things that have the right lifting property with respect to I are supposed to be equal to the weak equivalences, as well as, um, sorry, the intersection of the weak equivalences and things that have the right lifting property with respect to J. Uh, and um, again, this is this sort of uses the fact that that all of these things are checked level wise, um, and we know that they're true in spaces. So these are all checked level-wise on the spectra. And true in spaces. OK, so that's that's basically the proof. OK, so once we've done this for spaces, this is not really that difficult to do. Um, the, the, the most important thing, I, I think, is, is being able to use adjunctions to to make arguments like this. Um, so let's say a bit, so so we, we've described the uh, the vibrations and the acyclic vibrations in this category. Um, let's say a bit more about the co-vibrations. So there's a there's a characterization of the co-vibrations in Barnes and Reutzheim, um, which uh, I think I'm, I'm just going to state and not prove. Um, so what they say is that uh, a map from X to Y is a cofibration um, if and only if the following two properties hold. So first of all, uh, the induced map on zero spaces is a cofibration in pointed spaces. Um, and second, there are these there are these attaching maps which are also supposed to be cofibrations. 
So first, let's remember that spectra have structure maps that look like this. Um, uh, sorry, so xn plus one maps to yn plus one. And to be a uh, to be a map of spectra, this outside square is supposed to commute. So, um, so in particular, there's an induced map from the pushout. Suspension yn, uh, disjoint union over suspension xn with xn plus one to yn plus one. Um, so let's call this map sigma n, and sigma n must be a cofibration in tau. Uh, in particular, let's take the case where x is the initial spectrum, um, the spectrum whose all of whose uh, levels are just the point. Um, so the ma the unique map from the point to y is a cofibration. Um, if and only if uh, y zero is cofibrant. And the structure maps of y, suspension yn to yn plus 1, uh, is a cofibration. All right. So when x is a point, the, these maps sigma n just turn, turn into the structure maps of y. So in, partic in particular, this implies that all of the, um, all of the uh, terms in y have to be cofibrant as well. Um, and an example of a thing like this is a, is a CW spectrum. Okay. Um, all right, so, so this is most of what I wanna say about the level-wise model structure. And um, now I want to start building the, the stabilization of this, the stable model structure. Um, this takes a little bit more work and requires us to understand a little bit more uh, structure on this, on this category. Um, and so, I'm not going to be able to to finish it today, but I but I I think the last thing I'll do today is start talking a bit more about this structure. Um, so uh, so first of all, um, let's recall that there's some uh, that that spectra is tensored and cotensored over spaces. So we defined these spectra. Um, for x a spectrum and k a pointed space, we define spectra um, called x smash k and maps from k to x, which I'll write like this. Um, and these were these were defined so that for any k you get a junctions. Uh, So smashing with k is the left adjoint to uh, maps out of k. So there's a third piece of structure which is related to these two, which is an enrichment over topological spaces. Um, what we mean by enrichment is that instead of just sets of maps between two spectra, um, there's actually a topological space of maps. So the way that this is defined is um, if you have a map in spectra between x and y, this is in particular a choice of maps for, for every n of a map in pointed spaces between xn and yn. So let's view um, maps in spectra from x to y as a space by giving it the subspace topology here. So, um, so this lifts this the set of this gives the the set of maps a a topological space structure, um, and uh, and there's another adjunction, 
which is that, um, which is the following adjunction. So here X is supposed to be a spectrum and smashing a space with X is left adjoint to uh, maps and spectra out of X. Okay, so, um, so in summary, uh, spectra is tensored, cotensored and enriched over spaces. And, um, and, also, and all these structures are compatible with each other, uh, some of which is expressed in these, in these pairs of adjunctions. OK, um, so uh, right, OK, so this is going to get a little weird. Um, well, let me move to a new page for this. So suppose that that we have a model category which is uh, tensored, cotensored, and enriched over spaces. Um, and these three structures are supposed to satisfy some, some compatibilities. Then M is a topological model category. If the following statement holds. So for any uh, co-fibration in top and any co-fibration in the model category M, This is a cofibration in M. Um, here I'm using tensor product to denote the, the tensoring. Uh, and uh, this, this map is also acyclic. Um, if I or J is. Okay, so this, this map is sometimes called the push-out product of I and J. Uh, this is a monoidal structure on, well, I guess it's, it's not really a monoidal structure here, but, but it's a way of sort of tensoring two maps together uh, once, once you know how to tensor objects in M with objects in, in top. Um, okay, so uh, I guess I'm, I'm, sort of, uh, I'm sort of out of time, so, so maybe I should stop, but, but next time I'll say like what, what the hell this this weird looking axiom means, um, and and why it's true in the case of spectra, and I, I'll build the uh, the stable model structure. Um, all right, so let me stop the recording.